for December 5th, 2022. Can we have the roll? Andre Spinelli? Here. Jared Gardner? Here. Radhika Krishna? Here. Jim Winchester? Here. Scott Pullis? Here. Jeff Ron? Here. Brandy Eber? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Next item um, on the agenda are the minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Moved by Commissioner Polis, seconded by Commissioner Ron. Any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that motion uh, passes. Next up are disclosures. Commissioner Polis, I guess starting with you. No disclosures. Commissioner Winchester. No disclosures. Commissioner Spinelli. No disclosures. Commissioner Ron. Nothing to disclose. Commissioner Eber. No disclosures. Commissioner Krishna. No disclosures. And no disclosures for myself either. <clears throat> that brings us to our regular agenda, which is case 2022-0127. Um, can we hear a report from staff? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Gardner. Uh, before the Commission is a design study report abbreviated as a DSR for the Seward Highway and Alyeska Highway's intersection. The Commission uh, had this project before them as an informational item in March of 2021. This is the second step in the Context Sensitive Solutions Transportation Project review process. After the Planning and Zoning Commission's review, the project would then go before the Urban Design Commission uh, in a subsequent submission uh, to complete the third and final step of the process. The primary decision of the Commission for the DSR is of the alternatives for the project, and there are 13 topic areas to be included but not limited to, uh, to the Commission's deliberations. The refined uh, recommended concept level alternative that is based on alternative seven is the preferred alternative identified in the DSR. Uh, it would provide a southbound on-ramp and northbound off-ramp for the Seward Highway and a roundabout at the Alyeska Highway and Gold Avenue intersection. Reviewing agencies were supportive of the alternative. Uh, there is an additional item that I just passed out and that was emailed that we received as a late comment. It's a letter of opposition from the Girdwood Board of Supervisors or GBOS for this alternative. The department recommends approval of the refined recommended concept level alternative subject to conditions one through five in the staff report. Um, however, the department does recommend that the Planning and Zoning Commission motion tonight to hold a public hearing at the next available meeting prior to making a decision on the case. Uh, th that would be in alignment with the decision to hold public hearings on other recent projects with higher levels of public interest. And it follows code for street and trail review that provides uh, that a public hearing is not required but may be held at the commission's discretion. I had written in the staff report uh, that a meeting in February would be the next available one that's based on our normal application submittal guidelines. Since these materials are already prepared and uh, the case has been reviewed by agencies, then there's only a need to meet public notice requirements for advertising. So therefore, a public hearing could be held as early as January 9th, 2023. So if the commission decides uh, tonight to hold a public hearing, I recommend scheduling it for the January 9th, 2023 meeting. Uh, the Alaska Department of Transportation and their representatives are here tonight and still have the normal 10 minutes to speak on the project. There is no time tonight for public comments, so the commission may then either vote on the case or vote to hold, uh, or I should say motion, uh, uh, to hold a public hearing at the January 9th, 2023 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. If a public hearing is held, then there would be an opportunity for members of the public to speak. Um, that is the, the end of my summary of the staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no kind of questions pending from the commissioners, we'd be happy to hear from the petitioner. It looks like you'll have 10 minutes. I 
think there's a green sticker, although, yeah, there we go. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, through the chair, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the DSAR report for the Alyeska Highway and Seward Highway Intersection Improvements Project. My name is Juan Lee. I'm with RM Consultants, and I'll spell my name for the record V as in Victor, A N, last name is Lee, L E. Um, I'm representing the petitioner tonight, which is the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. With me, I also have the rest of my project team, including Tim Greer, who is RM's uh, project manager on the project, as well as Ryan Gensel and Joseph. Hordowski, they're both civil engineers who worked on the design of the project. And we have Taryn olsen Yell, who's here. Um, she supported all the CSS planning and community outreach that we've done for the project. So when we first started this project in 2020, um, our charge was from the Girdwood Board of Supervisors Resolution 2018-16, asking DOT to study the intersection because of the um, increasing congestion, um, perceived speeds along the highway, um, <clears throat> excuse me, safety issues, and one of the major ones is the left left turns um, towards going south on the Seward Highway from Girdwood, uh, going south towards the Kenai Peninsula. Um, there were other issues that we identified as we worked through the project, the CSS process with the community including the legal and physical access that isn't there for old Girdwood, and that's the neighborhood behind the Girdwood Station Mall. It used to be the Tesoro, and now it's Speedway, and now it's back to 7-Eleven. So um, the Girdwood Station Mall is one of the busiest gas stations in all of Alaska, and working with the national um, operators of that Girdwood Station Mall, it's actually probably one of the busiest ones that they have nationwide. So. I think we've all driven the intersection going down to the Kenai Recreation. If you're towing a camper, <laughs> it's really hard to get in and out of there. Um, it's very busy, it's very popular, and there's a lot of conflicts. We've heard from the trucking industry that it's very hard for their truck drivers to stop, to use the restrooms, have a rest, um, have a break, and a lot of times they're parking on the highway, which really adds to the issue of uh, visibility and delay at the intersection. We've heard a lot from Girdwood emergency fire um, responders about secondary access. So Toadstool Drive is that secondary access, and our project design does include uh, to keep that remaining for, for secondary for emergencies if there is an accident at the intersection. Also, the project, um, was asked to look at future planning as, as more development happens, as more and more people um, use the intersection and drive through the corridor. The project, as we got into the project, we really looked at it from two different elements. One is local access for the Gerwood community. There's approximately 2,000 people that live there. And then the second element is the national highway system that, that the Seward Highway is. So the first one is local access. So that's what the roundabout design is about. It's, it's for access to the Girdwood Station Mall. All the concerns we've heard about it um, from the very start or even before the project. And the second one is preserving the function of the National Highway System, the Seward Highway. So that Seward Highway section serves all of Anchorage, so 300,000 people, plus everyone from the Matsu Borough, um, I would say 80,000 to 100,000 people. Um, we even heard from people from Fairbanks who drive down to the Kenai, obviously go through the intersection. The freight trucking community obviously uses this to transport goods back and forth between uh, the Port of Alaska and then the Kenai Peninsula. Um, and then you add, a, add the 80,000 people that live down in the Kenai Peninsula borough. So there's a lot of people that use this intersection. So. Um, that's part of our project scope is to ensure the functionality, the through traffic um, keeps goods moving, and at the same time, looking at the issues that, that Girdwood is, has identified, some of the local issues like access, realigning the Alaska Highway to provide that access um, for continued uh, to access to the, to the community, a gateway into the community, as well as business access into the Girdwood Station Mall. And then, of course, additional benefits would be to, um, with the realignment of the Alaska Highway, 
is to reconstruct that Alaska Railroad Bridge, which has, is not meeting current safety standards. And in doing so, it helps to facilitate the um, connection with the old Iditarod Trail. Um, some, <clears throat> so our preferred alternative looks at those two items. They're not mutually exclusive, so we can't just pick and choose as the community um, has asked us to do. You just build the roundabout and not the interchange. Unfortunately, um, we've looked at, as um, the DSR states, 11 different alternatives, including the no-build. And the no-build does not solve the issues that were identified, um, including operations, safety, reducing uh, side angle crashes, um, you know, fatal and non-fatal. So there's uh, most of the, all of the alternatives we looked at, except for the, the preferred alternative, the preferred solution, which is the trumpet interchange, solves issues that we were um, tasked to solve and that were identified through the project. Um, I want to add that since we submitted the DSR application to the Planning Zoning Commission and the department, we have actually had more meetings with Gerwood Board of Supervisors. We've had a work session in September. Um, I think that went for almost two hours. We also met with the Roads and Utilities Subcommittee, um, Mike Edgington and Jennifer Wingard, at the end of September in Girdwood. They had additional questions that um, required additional engineering analysis, so we were happy to meet with them, go over um, different options with the trumpet interchange, how we can move it, how we can limit the impacts, the environmental concerns that the community had on the size, the location, and even the design of it. So our engineers worked and, and provided additional analysis. We met with them, gave an update, and then more recently, on November 21st, we were on the regular GBOS agenda. Uh, we went back to them because they asked us to look at the diamond interchange again. And so we did more analysis, looked at why that diamond interchange could or could not work, um, the additional environmental impacts, the size of the impacts, the cost of doing the diamond interchange compared to the preferred solution in the DSR, which is the trumpet interchange. Um, I just want to conclude that we've worked iteratively with GBOS and the community, resident stakeholders, business owners, the trucking industry, and um, we know that change is really hard for Girdwood, and I know that it is a big interchange. Um, and I think there's a lot of changes going on in Gerwin, and unfortunately, um, you know, they've submitted a letter to that they object to the preferred solution that we've prepared in the DSR. Um, and we're hoping that with, you know, a little more time, we could, we could work with them and, and help them um, see that we, given all the alternatives we've looked at and all the additional analysis that we still believe that the trumpet interchange, the preferred solution, is, is still the right one to go with to meet all the safety operations delay and also to help plan for future growth. The um, part of the Seward Highway between Potter and uh, just before the Gerwood Interchange, there's a project out right now to make that a four-lane divided highway. So our solution still would help work with, with the future planning of, of that corridor. And I just want to say that we have reviewed staff's recommendations and we agree with them. Thank you, and we are prepared to answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you very much for that presentation. Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, Ms. Lee, perhaps a little bit too on the nose, but. Um, uh, are you and the petitioner available on January 9th? Thank you, through the chair. That's a very good question. Yes, we are. Commissioner Spinelli. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, can you elaborate on why the, what the tight diamond doesn't do? Through the chair, thank you for the question. And to answer that question, I'm going to have either Joe or Ryan come up. <laughs> uh, Joe Horzdowski, J-O-E-H-O-R-8. 
A Z D O V. Sorry to interrupt. No. Yeah, it, it doesn't <laughs> pick it up unless you write on it. So yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Joe Horzdowski, J O E H O R A Z D O V S K Y. Um, we looked at the diamond interchange um, as one of our kind of alternatives to compare against the trumpet interchange. And that was one of the alternatives that we gave kind of a little bit more, uh, a little bit more analysis because it, as it pr progressed through our, our alternative design. Um, and its, its drawbacks were, you know, its, its ultimate cost and footprint um, compared to create a, a comparable, the same type of intersection that the trumpet provides. Um, and those end up being larger for the, for the diamond interchange and then also, it, it has two extra roundabouts um, or intersections, whether they be roundabout traffic signal or a stop sign, um, that create more conflict points to then the preferred alternative. Um, and there's more decision points. Also, it could create you know further congestion from, from one uh, intersection to another during peak times. <clears throat> and for those reasons, it was uh, determined to be not as you know, applicable as the preferred alternative. As a follow-up, so with the diamond, there's a light at Gold Avenue. Could that easily be a roundabout also? I guess I'm just curious. Yeah, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, where the where the diamond is um, at, at Gold Avenue for either the trumpet interchange or the diamond interchange, those intersections could be uh, either a roundabout or a stoplight or a stop sign. Theoretically, not all things being equivalent, but um, you know the roundabout was selected just for its. In this particular instance, it serves the best way to that we've our analysis showed to to put at that intersection. Okay, thanks. And then one more. Um, I'm pretty sure the Seward Highway and Alieska Highway are DOT right-of-ways. Are Gold Avenue and Main Street also DOT, or is that municipality? Gold Avenue and Main Street are both municipality of Anchorage owned roadways, right-of-ways. Commissioner Polis. Just a quick follow-up on the same situation. Um, the diamond interchange is more expensive in the estimate? Is that what it said? Yes, that is correct. And then the environmental impacts are basically comparable as far as the wetlands hit, or is it there a was little actually, less? Oh, sorry. No, you're good, you're good. <laughs> there was actually a, a bigger footprint needed, like I said, to tech create a comparable, um, you know, a similar type of functionality intersection that the trumpet provides ended up with a larger footprint. Okay, super interesting. And if I can just add some numbers to that, we did an analysis. The total footprint of the trumpet is 40 acres, um, and then the total footprint of the diamond is 46 acres. And part of the, it's also approximately 23 million more than the trumpet, and that's for three things additional earthwork, additional soil stabilization, and a new bridge over Glacier Creek. Through the chair, I'm just going to jump in one more. <laughs> um, do you know how much of this is funded by federal money compared to like local money, state and municipal? It's usually a very small amount compared to the federal, is my assumption. Um, through the chair, so it's currently state funded. There's five million dollars for design, environmental, all the studies, permitting. There is no construction money at the moment, but the project has to go through the National Environmental Policy Act, and that qualifies it for federal funding in the future.
Vision Polis, I see you flipping through there, so feel free to jump in if you've got other questions. <laughs> but otherwise, I guess um, I would just ask what the will of the body is on this one if we don't have anything further pending. And I've go. Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move in case 2022-0127 to direct the planning department to schedule a public hearing on January 9th, 2023 for the Alaska Highway and Seward Highway intersection improvements. Seconded by Commissioner Polis. Commissioner Ron, if you'd like to speak to your motion, feel free. Uh, just briefly, thank you, Mr. Chair. In keeping with uh, department comments, um, as noted in the staff packet, um, acknowledged availability by the petitioner and comments we have before us from the Girdwood Board of Supervisor, those being three primary reasons for the motion I've made. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Ron. Okay, seeing no further comments pending, we'll go ahead and call a vote. Ms. Krishna? Yes. Ms. Eber? Ms. Eber? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, seven votes in favor. That motion passes. The case is um, scheduled for a public hearing on January 9th. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda. We're moving to a public hearing items. Before we begin, I'll go ahead and read the procedure by which the public may speak to the commission at its meetings. After the staff presentation is completed on public hearing items, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules of procedure. Petitioners, including all of his or her representatives, will receive 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representative groups, community councils, PTAs, etc., will receive five minutes. Individuals receive three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. Any party of interest wishing to appeal shall first file with the planning director within seven days of the commission's decision made on the record a written notice of intent to appeal in accordance with AMC 2103050A.4.A. Commission recommendations to the Anchorage Assembly are not appealable. Following approval of the written findings of fact and decision, any party of interest may Within 20 days, file an appeal by filing a notice of appeal and paying the appeal fee and deposit in accordance with section 21.03.050. The notice of appeal must be filed with the planning director on a form prescribed by the municipality. If the appellant is not the applicant, the appellant's notice of appeal shall include proof of service on the applicant. And the first public hearing item on the agenda is case 2022-0103. Can we hear the report from staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On November 7th, 2022, a total of 289 public hearing notices were mailed in accordance with the procedures of AMC 21030220H. Notice as of this writing, no public comments have been received. The Spinard and Midtown Community Councils did not provide comments on this case. Reviewing agencies had no comments or objections to the request to amend the site plan or to the design variance. Panarctic Capital is requesting a design variance from AMC 21070080E1, table 2107-2, minimum site perimeter landscaping by abutting district or street, and an amendment to an approved site plan review. The existing fueling station was constructed in 1970. At the time, the property was zoned R2M. Fueling stations were not permitted in the R2M zoning district, so in 1994, this property was rezoned to B1ASL. The special limitations, AO94-168, required the completion of a site plan review. The applicant received approval for a site plan review, case number 2021-0063 and resolution number 2021-021, to formalize the fueling, the fueling station use on this property. 
This case was heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission on July 19th, 2021, and the resolution was approved at the August 2nd, 2021 meeting. As part of that case in 2021, the owner applied for an alternative equivalent compliance to reduce the landscaping width between the driveways along Tudor Road, which was approved. This AEC reduced the width from five feet down to three and a half feet along a 46 foot portion to maintain suitable vehicle access to fuel pumps. The existing fuel canopies of this site were also granted a dimensional variance, case 2021-0099 and resolution 2021-14. This case was heard by the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals on September 9th, 2021, and the resolution was approved at the November 10th, 2021 meeting. Since those cases, the owner has done vehicle movement studies and analysis showing the required perimeter landscaping impacting both fuel, de fuel delivery and customer refueling on the site. These studies show that maneuvering vehicles and tractor trailers with fuel is problematic, creating issues in the required landscaping along Tudor Road and Arctic Boulevard between the driveways if installed. Speaking to the design variance, in order for the Planning and Zoning Commission to approve the variance, the applicant must state with particularity the relief sought and must specify the facts or circumstances that are alleged to show that the application substantially meets the following eight standards. Standard A, the proposed alternative achieves the intent of the subject design standard to the same or better degree than the subject standard. Standard A is partially met. The proposed plan shows two trees and 19 shrubs along Tudor Road and one tree and eight shrubs along Arctic Boulevard. This is a reduction from the required five trees and 29 shrubs along Tudor Road and five trees and 30 shrubs along Arctic Boulevard. While the proposed plan provides fewer trees, it has increased the number of shrubs along the south and west property boundary by six to help offset some of the reduction regarding the constraints of this site. Standard B, the proposed alternative achieves the goals and the policies of the comprehensive plan to the same or better degree than the subject standard. Standard B is partially met. The proposed additional six shrubs along the south and west property boundary do offset some of the reduction by, by providing an alternative location for required landscaping. This, however, falls short of the reduction of seven trees and 32 shrubs through this request. The proposed landscaping does present a more attractive face to the intersection than what is currently there. Standard C, the proposed alternative results in benefits to the community that are equivalent to or better than compliance with the subject standard. Standard C is met. The goal of visual enhancement landscape is, is intended to in, integrate new or renovated development into the surrounding community. AMC 21070801D allows visual enhancement landscaping to be organized to the best advantage of the property development. The alternative achieves this goal by replacing existing paving and providing landscaping that integrates the existing development better into the community, defining drives, softening the impact of the fueling station use, and is organized to allow the fuel islands and tanks to still be used. Standard D, the variance if granted will not adversely affect the use of adjacent property as permitted in this code. Standard D is met. The variance would not impact the adjacent property as permitted. The adjacent property is Pop Car Park. This fueling station has been located adjacent to the park since it was constructed, again in 1970. Perimeter landscaping abutting the park on the west and south property boundary is being added to bring the site into compliance with the current code. Standard E, the variance if granted does not change the character of the zoning district where the property is located, is in keeping with the intent of the code and does not permit a use not otherwise permitted in the district in which the property lies. Standard E is met. The proposed use does not change the character of the zoning district or the intent of the code. The original site plan review approval last year formalized the existing use of this site, keeping with the intent of the code. The lack of landscaping does not change the character of the site or the zoning district. The landscaping has never existed in this location at this site. Standard F, persons with disabilities are provided with access as required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and reasonable accommodation. Standard F is met. Site upgrades were completed as part of the site plan review process with the building permit. This work included upgrading the existing site to accommodate accessible pedestrian connections to the bus stop along Arctic Boulevard, ramps to access the commercial structure, and ADA compliant parking spaces. Standard G, the variance if granted does not adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the municipality. 
Standard G is met. There currently is no landscaping along Tudor or Arctic since the gas station was constructed. Landscaping could impact the safety of the site for vehicles entering and exiting the site. Standard H is evaluating, in evaluating the request for a variance from the maximum sign height. Standard H is met. The standard is not applicable due to this variance request not being related to signs. Now in regard to the amendment, an application for administrative or major site plan review shall be approved upon finding that the site plan meets all of the following four criteria. Criteria one, the site plan is consistent with any previously approved subdivision, plat, plan development, master plan, or any other precedent plan or land use approval. Criteria one is met. This site has been in existence since 1970. The, the site was developed in the R2M zoning district when fueling stations were not permitted. In 1994, the property was rezoned to B1A with special limitations to bring the fueling station into compliance with the proper zoning district. The special limitations required a non-public hearing site plan review to formalize the use of this property. The existing site plan was approved by resolution 2021-021 by the Planning and Zoning Commission at its August 2nd, 2021 meeting. Criteria two, the site plan complies with all applicable development and design standards outlined in the title, including, but not limited to the provisions in chapters 2104, zoning districts, 2105, use regulations, chapter 2106, dimensional standards and measurements, and chapter 2107, development and design standards. Criteria two may be met with the granting of the variance. The proposed revised landscape plan shows the elimination of the L1 landscaping requirement along the north and east property boundaries between the driveways along Tudor Road and Arctic Boulevard and a reduction in the northeast corner. This is a reduction of seven trees and 32 shrubs along the north and east property boundaries with a partial offset of six shrubs within the perimeter landscaping along the south and west property boundary. Criteria three, the site plan addresses any significant adverse impacts that can reasonably be anticipated to result from the use by mitigating or offsetting those impacts to the maximum extent feasible. Criteria three is met. The proposed convenience storm fueling station are existing and it is not anticipated to create adverse impacts on the surrounding uses. Criteria four, the development proposed in the site plan is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. Criteria four is met. The proposed improvements to the site are consistent with the 2040 land use plan and policies as outlined in the staff packet on pages seven and eight. Recommendations of, st of the department. The department finds that standards A and B are only partially met, while standards C, D, E, F, G, and H are met regarding the design variance. Therefore, the department must recommend denial of the variance if, after a public hearing, the commission finds that all eight standards are substantially met, then the approval should be subject to conditions A, 1, 2, and 3, found on page 9 of your staff packet. The department also finds that the approval criteria for an amendment to a site plan review is not fully met, but can be with the approval of the requested design variance. Therefore, the department re must recommend denial of this amendment if, after public hearing, the commission finds the approval criteria has been met, then approval should be subject to conditions B, one and two, also found on page nine of your staff packet. I can answer any questions that the commission may have and the petitioner's representative, Melissa Branch with Big City Engineers is in attendance. Commissioner Spinelli. Um, can you walk me through the timeline again of when when, the, when there was a note to require a site plan review and then when the site plan happened, and was there something that triggered that? So AO 94-168, when they rezoned from, B, from R2M to B1SAL, required a site plan review. Um, the previous owners never got that site plan review, and had they done that, we would not be here today. Um, so the newer owner, of course, came before the commission in uh, 2021 and got approval of their site plan at that time. And was that just vol? I guess we can, I can save those questions for later. Uh, you can, by all means, <laughs> Commissioner Spinelli, ask away. Well, I guess, uh, um, was there any discussion about which code to apply to the site plan review, the 94 code or the current code? The current 
code, and, and if you turn the page, sorry, I'm going real quick, 33 of your staff packet, there's the non-conforming status, verification of non-conforming status. So the petitioner requested that to find out whether or not they would have to meet current code or could have been basically grandfathered, is what you would call it, the uh, 1994 code. And it was determined that they had not gotten an approved site plan and so they were then subject to current code. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Winchester. In, 20, in 2021, there was a set of six conditions uh, applied to this. Do you know if all of those conditions have been met at this point? I'm looking at Melissa Branch shaking her head. Yes, they have been. Through the chair, sorry. Okay, I don't see, oh, Commissioner Ron, feel free if you've got a question. Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, Mr. Hatcher, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate your attempts to make this understandable. However, I'm still a little bit confused. Um, site landscaping is, is a bit confusing to those who aren't, aren't familiar with it. So can you help me further understand um, what we're talking about here uh, as applicable to this site for the type of landscaping? Um, getting to know L1, L2, L3, and L4, um, maybe using those terms with respect to the zoning for the lot and the surrounding areas. And the nature of my question is to better understand the purpose of this particular landscaping in question. Through the chair, Commissioner Ron, so abutting streets in this zoning district is L1, site perimeter landscaping. Um, Typically it's eight feet in width. It can be narrower than that, but it's mainly the count of shrubs and trees that's required. So if this were a brand new property that hadn't ever been developed, that would be the requirement. I don't know if that, did that fully answer what you're looking for? Close enough for now, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Polis. Just one quick clarification in the department recommendation A2, it's saying installation of additional landscaping trees within the perimeter landscaping to offset the reduction. Is it saying in addition to what they've already proposed in their proposed landscaping plan or just basically swap everything that they would have to have there and put it somewhere else on site? Is that what it's saying? Through the chair, Commissioner Pauls, it's more of a, it's, a, it's what the commission would recommend I I wouldn't see that the commission is going to recommend all the trees and shrubs that they're not putting in but they might ask for additional shrubs or trees be put in that other perimeter landscaping on the south and west property lines but that's complete up to you and that reminded me of a question I had um, which might be a little early and um, might be better suited to the applicant, but uh, you know, I assume there were discussions in the course of, of of putting this together between the planning department and the applicant. And I'm wondering, with respect to those first two conditions that you concluded were only partially met, um, how if there were kind of suggestions or things that the planning department was looking for in order to feel comfortable that those were met that weren't provided, or or if it didn't quite get to that level of specificity. Mr. Chair, that it didn't get to that level of specific, I can't even say the word. We didn't get to that point. We knew that they had uh, put in the six additional shrubs and assumed that the commission would come, would communicate with them as to what they felt was a reasonable amount to possibly offset. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any questions pending at the moment, so um, we've got 10 minutes. My name is Melissa Branch, B-R-A-N-C-H with Big Seniors, and I have Doug Peoples with Panart at Capital with me, he's owner's representative. Um, <clears throat> something to clarify in the mud of this process is that when 
The gas station was built in 1970. It was actually transitioning from borough to, to city, right? And the code's changing. And I think that that's where it happened with, there was no zoning or it wasn't an R2M, right? And then it became an R2M. And then as they were updating things in the 1990s is when they realized that this existing use wasn't allowed in it and asked for the ordinance with that upgrade to then trigger that. And my client actually purchased the property in late 2020, early 2021. And if the site plan review had been done by the previous owner, everything would have been grandfathered, right? We would have had the non-conforming determination. And as Paul said, we wouldn't be here before you tonight asking for this. So we came last year with the site plan review and, and worked our best to try to come towards compliance with current code and the landscaping requirements that are there. Um, actually, once it was approved and we'd gone through the building approval process, we actually cut the landscape beds in. So both along Tudor and along um, Arctic. And, but we didn't plant, it was late in the season and we didn't plant the beds for survivability of the, the plantings. And that gave us, I guess, that opportunity or we realized there was an issue and that when spring melt came and we had the beds cut in right and the asphalt removed that we got to see some of the problems. Because you know, you do turning, maneuvering, analysis, and that kind of depends. It's a basis on somebody drives, but then there's the physicality of how people actually drive and use the site. And we got to watch that and monitor it. And that's where we realized we had the issue and we came before you um, and worked with the planning department to come back before you to ask for the variance from the landscaping because it's it's to the point where if we install the landscaping as code would require and that as we tried to with the AEC is that the site doesn't function right so there's not vehicles don't function well you don't have the turning maneuvering so fuel can't come to the site and then people can't actually come to the site to get through to use all the the, the fueling stations right so it can't function in its use if we do that um, we did install and we did have improved the landscaping along the south and the west. Um, and I, I was asking him, but I don't know that he'd have objection if we had to increase plantings there. What we tried to do was we relocated the propane tank that was in the northwest corner so that we could put plantings there that weren't there previously. And then we worked really closely actually with street maintenance and right of way to try to increase plantings to soften that impact on the intersection of Tudor and Arctic but still maintain visibility and their equipment's on our property, you know, to maintain that and that they could still access it, which is why the shrubs and not all of the trees um, as we were back in the iterative process with that. So that is, so that's why with those first two standards, looking at having to come to current code, them being partially met, but really it's kind of the long process back through this entire thing that this, it, it would have been met if things had been done before my owner came and then tried to do the right thing to come back through process. So I'd like to answer any questions you have. Um, otherwise, I guess I'll hold for rebuttal. Commissioner Spinelli. Yes, um, what prompted you to get the site plan review? Um, when they went to submit, so we got the non-conforming determination and when they went to submit the building permit, they were told that they couldn't do it without having they had to go through the site plan review. Okay. So it was a, it came back from the Muni after the non-conforming determination that we had to go through that process before any permits would be granted for the property. So some, some like upgrades to the building. Mm -hmm. okay. So they upgraded the building, they upgraded the canopies. I don't know if you've been to this site and I know the, the posting photos don't show it, but they've really done, I mean, the accessible upgrades, we've redone parking, we've added the landscaping <clears throat> on the south and west side, we've worked to define drive. So they really have worked to upgrade the site and then, and then refresh it too, you know, as new owners with color scheme and new paint and, and all of that and then work on the building. <clears throat> I guess I'm curious if you could clarify and maybe help paint a picture in, in my head talking about the four kind of corners and and edges of the site, what um, what landscaping is kind of currently being added? Now, you know, the south and the west kind of already have a green space kind of behind Wait, but we them, were right? required to add by current code standards L1 visual enhancement landscaping and so that was added on property even though we about mm -hmm. the park and that plantings there and in addition to that the my the, the owner actually installed fencing along the south and west side because it helped 
um, kind of push the pedestrians to the edge of the site to actually use the pathways that we laid out versus you know, cutting through the site so we didn't have the vehicle pedestrian impacts. Okay, and then, and then you mentioned the north, I think you mentioned the northwest that some tanks were removed yes. to permit? Relocated. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what exactly is on the or is planned for to the extent it's not there on the northwest corner? The Plantings. Moment? I mean, the L1 visual enhancement actually a little um, for that small area that would be required. You know, the trees and the shrubs that would be required there. So, so that little section would meet like what the code requirement is. It's the kind of in between the drives is where the maneuvering is and the problem is. Okay, and then so there is there is something on the northeast as well. Yes. So that's where the sign is, and we're actually proposing to increase that area over the existing, you know, to pull that and make that a little wider to encompass the sign and to add plantings in that corner as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, Current interest in the bollards on the eastern lot line. Um, can you help me understand what is or isn't um, requested for adjustment to the landscaping plan in that area? So where those bollards are adjacent to the fuel islands, we would, what we're proposing is to have no changes there. And part of it was just, if you look at, oh, I think I tagged the drawings and I will tell you so. Um, if you look at, page 55 in your packet, it's the fuel truck, and that really is kind of the biggest, right? When the double tanker comes, you can see the drag, and it drags down across that area. And so what we were looking at is that it impacts so much of where we'd be able to, pl to plant, you know, from that drag along there. And then what happens is then, if you flip, right, both the vehicles and the trucks, as they go to turn in and out, say those two driveways onto Arctic, they start to drag the top and bottom of it. So it gives you this really tiny area where you can plant like a shrub that's not gonna survive. And so that's why the request to remove it along there. So the, the bollards would remain as they are in the, in the pavement. Following up on that question, so the, the bollards would remain, but the northern extent of what's shown on page 53 for the landscaping plan in that area then would not be planted if you were to overlay 53 on 55 pages. Right, that's what was previously approved. So the northeast corner, that kind of triangle piece would remain, but the part that's in between the two driveways on Tudor is what we were proposing. That was what was originally designed, and we realized we have the drag issues across, and that's what would be removed with this variance request. So in effect, then, that eastern lot line, uh, I'm drawing a conclusion here, would have no vegetation in between the driveways? Correct. And you would just see bollards from the street? Yes. Okay. Thanks. nothing currently in the queue. I guess we'll go ahead and officially open this up, I guess, to the public. And um, seeing nobody here coming forward, there's no one on the line either. So you've got your six minutes and 36 seconds for rebuttal to use as you see fit. I don't know that it'll take all six minutes, but I feel like it's our request, after much debate back and forth between us and the planning department and us internally, um, the client and I, that given circumstances and the strange circumstances, this is the most complicated planning thing I've ever been through, is that just kind of the circumstances of when the property was developed and how code changed and the zoning changed and the ownership changed and things weren't taken care of, is that it created a situation that created a hardship on my, new, on my client, on the new owner, and they've worked really hard to address it, but now we're in a situation where the landscaping is actually causing an issue, if in her original, um, when we came to you last year, um, installed would actually prohibit the overall use of the site. Um, and so, given all of those circumstances, we feel that all of the conditions are met um, because the subject standard should have been something previous and not what it is now, um, and that we've done our best to have public safety, both vehicle and pedestrian improvements through the site, and to install the landscaping that we can along both those roadways, um, in addition to what we've installed along the south and the west to improve the site. 
the new one. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and officially close the public hearing. And I look for the commission. What's the will of the body here? And I think as, a, as an aside, I believe we will need to have two separate motions, um, one for the variance and then one for any related amendment to the site plan. Mr. Spinelli. I'll move in case 2022-0103 to approve design variants from AMC 2107.080E.1 to allow the elimination of the site perimeter landscaping requirement along Tudor and Arctic between driveways and a reduction in the required landscaping at the northeast corner of the property subject to conditions one through three shown on page nine of the staff report. Thank you, Commissioner Spinelli, for your motion. That motion is seconded by Commissioner Winchester. Commissioner Spinelli, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah, um, I intend to support the motion because I do not see the ability for this site to continue doing what it has done for, I guess, 50 years without the variance. Um, that and the circumstances related to the code change and the lack of site plan, I think that we have somebody that's improving things and trying to meet code but can't meet all of today's code given the fixed location of the infrastructure. Commissioner Winchester? Yeah, I'll just note that there was uh, no uh, testimony in opposition to this uh, variance. I intend to support it. Um, I intend to support the motion as well, and I think I'll just add um, a quick finding that, you know, with respect to the criteria A and B that speak to, I guess more specifically A, the intent of the design standard, I, I don't view the intent of the design standard as, as um, requiring um, an implementation that would preclude kind of the use of the site. And we already have a site plan review that's been approved that um, includes a use, that includes the location of the facilities. And, you know, if this were a new project from scratch, I think that might be viewed differently because there might be opportunities to adjust it. But we already have those components approved, and so I don't think that this, the, um, the um, landscaping is intended to kind of negate all of that. And relatedly, I'll just note that we heard some testimony with respect to um, the fact that the, the beds that are in the approved plan were, were already cut into place. And I think that's reflecting the kind of good faith of the applicant in trying to make the originally approved plan work. Okay, seeing nothing further, we'll go ahead and call the vote. Excuse me, Ms. Krishna? Yes. Ms. Eber? Yes. Thank you. Seven votes in favor, that motion passes. And that leaves us just with um, one pending item, which is an amendment to the site plan review. Commissioner Winchester. I move in case 2022-0103 to approve an amendment to an existing approved site plan review of a fueling station and convenience store, case 2021-0063, resolution 2021-021, subject to conditions one and two, shown on page nine of the staff report. Thank you, Commissioner Winchester. Your motion is seconded by Commissioner Ron. Commissioner Winchester, would you like to speak to your motion? 
Yeah, just all the same items we brought up before. Uh, all the other previous conditions were met other than this. And like uh, Chair Gardner mentioned, cutting in the asphalt shows the intent to uh, meet all conditions. And uh, therefore, uh, I'll approve the uh, site plan review. Okay, I don't see any other comments pending. We'll go ahead and call a vote for this as well. Ms. Krishna? Yes. Ms. Eber? Yes. Thank you. Seven votes in favor. That motion passes as well. Um, only item remaining on the agenda is to adjourn if there's a motion. Moved by Commissioner Pullis, seconded by Commissioner Winchester. We are adjourned. Thank you.